everyone, and greetings from Scotland. I'm Delaney. And I'm Hadley. And this is Twice, Twice as Good. Scotland, along with Wales, England, and Northern Ireland are the four countries that make up the United Kingdom. Scotland shares a border with England to the southeast and is surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean to the north and west. The North Sea to the northeast, the Irish Sea to the south, and the North Channel to the southwest. Scotland is steeped in rich history and distinct culinary traditions. Today, chefs from St. Andrew's Link's culinary team will share their take on several of Scotland's signature dishes. And in between recipes, we'll be visiting a sampling of Scotland's most notable sites to explore its history, learn about its custom, and reveal its scientific and literary masterminds. For golfers, there's no place more central to the roots of the game than St. Andrew's. Today, we'll visit St. Andrew's Old Course, the birthplace of golf. We'll visit the Highland Games to learn about Scotland's ancient sporting traditions. Take a trip to the La Caron Kilt Center for a first-hand look at the making of traditional Scottish tartan kilts and stop over at Edinburgh's Writers' Museum to explore three Scottish literary legends. We'll trek through Johnston Terrace Garden and National Wildlife Trust to learn about Scotland's wildlife and wildflowers, monster hunt at Loch Ness, step back in time at Stirling Castle, and explore how bagpipes and Scottish dance contribute to Scotland's rich musical traditions. We've got a full day ahead, so let's tee off our twice as good tour of Scotland. Series games are the oldest free games in Scotland. Games have been held here in Series, a village in Fife, Scotland, at the end of June since 1314. Today is the 705th anniversary of these games. How do the Highland Games as we know them now compare to the original event? Well, the original events would have been feats of strength. So the men of the village would be demonstrating their strength to the Lord Marshal as warriors. So they'd be, they'd be having sword fights, they'd be having bow and arrow competitions, and then they'd be throwing very heavy weights to demonstrate how strong they were as soldiers. That's gradually evolved over the years. So you have the shot pot, you have this 56 pound weight, you have the wheat sheaf, and of course you have the very iconic cable. And it's, um, I think it's unique to Scotland where we try and get a tree trunk and throw it up in the air. Not many countries do that. New traditions last over 700 years, so why do you think the series games have continued for over seven centuries? That, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think it's more got to do with the Scots' identity more than anything else. Uh, the Scots are a very proud culture, a very iconic culture. Anywhere you go in the world, if you find a Scotsman, not very far behind, you find tartan, you find bagpipes, and you find the Highland Games. Throwing the weight for distance involves a competitor throwing a weight made of metal with a handle as far as possible. Usually, a spinning technique is employed. The longest throw wins. Competitors throwing the weight for height attempt to throw the weight over a horizontal bar using only one hand. Each athlete is allowed three attempts at each height. The competition is determined by the highest successful toss. Competitors in the sheaf pitch or sheaf toss use a pitchfork to hurl a burlap bag filled with straw over a horizontal bar above the competitor's head. Stain is the Scottish word for stone. This event is similar to the modern day shot foot, but using a stone. Most athletes in the open stone event use either a glide or spin technique. In the caber toss, the competitor tosses a long tapered pole called a caber, which is usually made from a large tree and is typically 19 feet, 6 inches tall, and weighs 175 pounds. is a type of knee-length, back-pleated skirt that originated as part of the traditional dress of the Scottish Highlands. Tartan is a pattern consisting of crisscrossed, horizontal, and vertical multicolored bands. Scottish kilts almost always have tartan patterns. Lacaron of Scotland is the world's leading manufacturer of tartan. 
Lacaron has been weaving tartan patterns and making traditional Scottish kilts since 1892. So it's the perfect place to find out what goes into creating the fabric and signature clothing that's synonymous with Scotland. The tartan fabric is made by the interlacing of the vertical threads, which is your warp threads, and the horizontal threads, which is your weft, and they intersect by lifting and moving through each other to create a structure, which is your cloth. Warp and weft are the two basic components used in weaving to turn thread or yarn into fabric. The lengthwise or longitudinal warp yarns are held stationary in tension on a frame or loom. The transverse weft is drawn through and inserted over and under the warp. A single thread of the weft crossing the warp is called a pick. Given kilts don't have pockets, can you tell us about sporins? So a sporin has been created and it's a, it's a sort of little purse or a bag, if you like, that is held onto the front of the kilt and it's held on with a chain that sits around the waist of the, of the person wearing it. Scottish um, tartans and kilts are a big part of the culture here. People wear them to weddings, they wear them for black tie events, burn suppers, Hogmanay, which is uh, New Year in Scotland. So it's a big part of the coming together of people and they quite often will wear their tartan that's associated with their family. When in Scotland, you should dress like the Scottish. I'll take the high road, and I'll take the low road, and we'll both be in Scotland before ye! Edinburgh is the world's first UNESCO-designated city of literature, and is regarded by many fans as the home of Harry Potter. While J.K. Rowling wasn't born in Scotland, she did write a good deal of the first Harry Potter books in Edinburgh. Edinburgh's Writers' Museum at the Lawn Market on the Royal Mile is the perfect place to explore the work of three of Scotland's foremost writers, Robert Burns, Walter Scott, and Robert Louis Stevenson. So now this ground floor section is pretty much dedicated entirely to Robert Burns, who was considered to be the national poet of Scotland. Why was he regarded as the plowman poet? You have to imagine that he himself was trying to be a very prominent farmer as well. I think one of the other reasons for that is because he spoke very much to the common man. A lot of the poems and everything that he wrote throughout the years are something that are exactly the same today and he echoes a lot of the way people feel still nowadays. And for Scotland as well, it's quite interesting because it echoes their, our own history through his poems. <laughs> years, St. Andrew's Links, much like Scotland itself, has evolved, but many of Scotland's signature foods have remained staples of the Scottish diet through the centuries. Ian MacDonald, food and beverage manager at St. Andrew's, is an expert on Scotland's culinary traditions. Okay girls, this is the haggis. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Is haggis the national dish of Scotland? Yes it is, and it's traditionally served as it is now with potatoes and turnips, or neeps and tatties as we call it and it's usually served with a whiskey sauce. What's the first step to preparing haggis? So I'll start off with uh, cooking the turnip and the carrots and potatoes. While I'm cooking that, I'll cut the haggis. So haggis is ingredients from like sheep. So it's the heart, liver, lungs, oats and seasoning. So it's in the bottom of the mould. I've got the potatoes, mashed potatoes with some butter some cream, a little bit of salt. So here's the turnip and the carrots. So turnip in first. So that's nice smooth consistency, the potato, and then the tie, potato. We call it tie, and you just call it potato. So that's uh, haggis in the bottom, turnip in the middle, and the potato on top, and then. So now that the mold's off, this will get cooked in the oven for about 15, 20 minutes. Okay. So now this has been cooked, I'm going to put a bed of whiskey sauce on the bottom of the plate. So a whiskey sauce, just a cream based sauce, whiskey which is um, flambéed, and then some cream, white wine sauce, bring it together, and then some chives to finish. Then the haggis cake, 
finish for garnish, we've got some turnip tobacco. So that's just uh, deep fried uh, shaved turnip. Haggis, neeps and tatties on a bed of whiskey sauce, garnished with turnip tobacco. So would you like to try some? Yes. Mm, this is so good. It's so unique. I've never tasted anything like it before. We're proud of our heritage and I'm glad you enjoy the haggis. course here at St Andrews known as the home of golf. Well it's where golf was invented, um, it's where it started, it's the oldest course in the world. How many times has the Open Championship been played here at St Andrews? It's actually been played here 29 times. Can anyone play St Andrews on any day? Anyone can play St Andrews, yes. It's one of the nicest things about St Andrews. It's a public golf facility so anybody can play it anywhere in the world. All right, time to putt. That's a really good putt, that might go in. Oh, that was really good. Right, shall we finish these off? I'm going to take the flag out this time. Yeah. How has St Andrews affected the development of modern golf? St Andrews has affected the development of golf in a huge way, to be honest, and we have to talk about Tom Morris. Tom Morris was the very first golf professional. He was, a, he was the very first club maker, the very first green keeper. So a lot of the things he did were completely pioneering for the time and they were then used and developed as, as years went by. Also St Andrews was the very first place to have a female golf club as well. So I'd say St Andrews has definitely played a big role in, in developing golf around the world. It's a special place for sure. No instrument in the world is more closely identified with Scotland than the bagpipe, and the sounds and music it creates are quintessentially Scottish. A set of bagpipes consists of an air supply, a bag, a chanter, and at least one drone. The chanter is the melody pipe and is played with two hands. The chanter consists of a number of finger holes and often looks similar to a recorder or flute. Almost all bagpipes have at least one chanter. Some pipes have two chanters. The notes from the chanter are produced by a reed installed at its top. The drone is the harmonizing pipe, it has no finger holes, and produces a constant harmonizing note throughout play. The drones may lie over the shoulder or across the arm opposite the back and may run parallel to the chanter. Many bagpipes have multiple drones. The airbag is an airtight reservoir that holds air and regulates its flow via arm pressure, which allows the player to maintain a continuous, even sound. The most common way of supplying air to the bag is to blow into a blowpipe or blow stick. Some pipes use bellows to supply air to the bag. The chanter and the drones are usually open-ended, so there's no easy way for the player to suddenly stop the pipe from sounding until the air supplied to the chanter and the drone exits the bagpipe. If you want to learn how to play the bagpipe, what is the hardest thing to learn? It's a combination. You have to learn to read music. You know, it's a simple scale. Then you have to learn how to make the embellishments. A simple note is fine, but then it has a grace note on it or an embellishment and then they, have, they get more complicated, things, things called Tur Lewis and then Kron Lewis, which involves about 11 notes. These are the most difficult things to learn and practice. And of course, you have to learn how to maintain a sound. You know, if you play the piano and just do that, you get a sound. If you play the bagpipe, you have to blow. And then you have to be fit. Glasgow Tower on the south bank of the River Clyde represents the high point of the Glasgow Science Centre complex. It's the tallest fully rotating freestanding structure in the world. It's an appropriate metaphor for the high place in which Scotland holds its Nobel Prize winning scientists and their lasting scientific contributions. <laughs> Pan fried Isle of Gia halibut that we cooked this morning. Oh, thank you. So, how did the Scottish Isle of Gia become so known for its sustainable halibut? Since 2007, they harvested their first halibut, and ever since then, you know, we uh, we use it. We love it. 
So I'm going to start filling the Isla Gear halibut, come around the head, and I'm just going to follow the line. Taking one fillet off, I'm just going to trim the fish up, and I'm going to let the knife do the work. And I'm going to cut in a nice, nice sized portions, roughly six ounce. So now I'm going to move on to my risotto. So I've got some hot shellfish stock, a little bit of vegetable oil in my pan. I'm going to start off with my shallot. I'm just going to cook it nice and slow, and my celery. I'm going to add in my uh, risotto rice. Just going to get that a little bit of heat. So a little bit of white wine in, I'm just going to cook that out. So now I'm going to start adding my stock in. I'm just going to stick the rice to the back and I'll just let that cook out. With any bit of meat or fish that I cook, I'll always oil it first before it goes into the pan. At this point, I'll season the top. So a nice hot pan, get a nice bit of colour into the fish. So that's got a nice golden brown colour. Just going to turn that over, lemon juice into the pan. Put a little bit of butter in. All that nice lemony, buttery flavour over the halibut. So I'm just going to take that out. Just let that sit there. So I've got some nice samphire here. I'm just going to finish my risotto now. So I've got some freshly cooked crab, some Scottish mussels that have been cooked in the uh, white wine. I'm just going to warm them through, just gently. I'm just going to finish that with some freshly shelled peas. So I'm just going to put a little bit of parmesan into it, a little bit of butter. Gives the result a wee bit of shine. And I'm just going to put some freshly cut chives just for a bit of colour at the end. I'm just going to gently mix that through now. You see it's just holding its shape. It's just falling in on itself, nice and soft. In my bowl, I'm just going to put a nice spoon of the risotto. I'm just going to put a bit of halibut on the top. Just rest that on the top. Just to finish the dish, I'm going to put some of the samphire. Just kind of drizzle that round. See purslin. I'm just going to Put a couple in. I like gear halibut with a shellfish risotto. Wow, the halibut tastes so fresh and amazing. I'm glad you like it. Stirling Castle is one of Scotland's largest and most historically significant castles. It is surrounded on three sides by steep cliffs, giving it a strong defensive position. The castle's long and turbulent history links it with legendary Scottish figures such as Mary Queen of Scots, William Wallace, and Robert the Bruce. I am Lady Fleming Janet Stewart, a lady-in-waiting to Marie de Guise and the aunt and governess to our young queen, Mary Stuart. That's Mary Queen of Scots to you. When was this castle built? Well, the castle is built over many different centuries. In fact, many different kings added to the castle as we continued throughout history. Can you tell us a little bit about the furnishings in the room? Everything here is designed to send you a message because, of course, only the most important people are invited into this chamber. From the fine silk brocades hanging upon the wall from Italy to the green paints, the malachite of northern Africa. Is this the Great Hall? It is indeed, yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about Mary, Queen of Scots? Well, she was, as you know, born at Linlithgow Palace, but brought here when she was just a few months old. Well, as her governess, it was my responsibility to oversee her upbringing. Does she have a strong will? She did indeed. In fact, she is well known for it. Well, when you are made queen when you're only six days old, it does tend to affect one slightly. But I think a strong will is important, for she will go on to rule an entire country. Not an easy task. Scotland is home to magnificent birds of prey. The peregrine falcon is the fastest creature in Scotland, reaching speeds in excess of 200 miles per hour. Loch Lomond Bird of Prey Centre provides the ideal environment to explore Scotland's majestic birds. What you're looking at here, girls, this is a red kite, which is a native species to the UK now. It was reintroduced after becoming extinct over 100 years ago. This particular hawk was taken from the wild illegally in Belgium two years ago. And I was given the responsibility of rehoming it and seeing what we could do training-wise getting it flying. And you can see he's doing very well. This is a female golden eagle. She's called Orla. She's 16 years old and she's been here since she was five months old. But in Scotland, 
We've got over 500 breeding pairs. That's up 10% in the last 10 years, which is really good. The second biggest bird of prey in Scotland. How wide can a wingspan become? Wow. Wow. Now that's not them fully extended. How fast can they fly? Believe it or not, this is the second fastest creature on Earth. It's estimated that they, in a dive, they can approach speeds nearly 200 miles an hour. What can people do to help protect hawks? If people want to protect wildlife and birds of prey in particular, it's all about observation, watching what's going on. If they suspect anything's wrong, then they report it to the appropriate authorities, namely the police. You just turn slightly, here she comes. Steady, steady, steady. There you go. Wow, that's really amazing. Unique wildlife roams throughout Scotland and beautiful wildflowers grow in its meadows. There is no better place to see both than at Johnston Terrace Garden, a reserve cared for by the Scottish Wildlife Trust. So right now we're in Johnston Terrace Garden, which is in the middle of central Edinburgh. We've got the castle just behind us and it's a really important urban green space so people in the city can come and enjoy it. So we get loads of cool wildflowers in Scotland and they all grow at different times of the year and in different conditions. So at the start of the year in January and February you might see the lovely white flowers of snowdrops and then in spring in the woodlands you'll get lovely carpets of bluebells and then in the summer you'll see wildflower meadows like this one at Johnston Terrace. What kind of wildlife calls Scotland home? So we've got quite common mammals like foxes and badgers that you might see here or in urban areas as well as the countryside but then we have more rare species, more threatened species like the red squirrel and the pine martin and even the Scottish wildcat as well. <laughs> Just like a golf ball. Yeah. Today we're having Cranachan, which is a traditional Scottish dish. It's usually made with raspberries, but we make it here with strawberries. So the egg yolks go in and the sugar goes in. So we're going to cook this out. So I'm going to move to this one. So this is the cream, and then we're going to fold the egg mixture through the cream. Also to this, we're going to add honey. And we have our own honey bees here and drambuie. We have toasted oats that go into it, porridge oats, staple diet for Scottish people. Fold in the strawberries that we've cut up here. And this is the end product. We'll pop it into a piping bag. So this is icing sugar and water and food colouring to represent the grass. So now I'm ready to fill the golf ball with the Kranachan mix. We would garnish this up with granola and raspberries and some mint. And that's how we serve it in St Andrews. And what we say to customers is you take your spoon and you hit it like you'd hit a drive. So you just smash it open and then you eat the, the Kranachan. Mm, that's really good, it's really sweet. The strawberry gives it such a good, fruity flavour. Highland dancing is a style of dancing developed in the Scottish Highlands in the 19th and 20th centuries. Highland dancing is often performed to Highland bagpipe music and dancers wear specialised shoes called ghillies. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of Scottish Highland dance? So Scottish Highland dance started hundreds and thousands of years ago up in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, it used to be a celebratory dance um, when men would win in battle or if they were celebrating they would dance over their swords or they would dance with their friends and that was how Highland dancing kind of started. Um, they wore the kilt because that was the Scottish dress at the time. Um, and that has just continued to be the Scottish dress until now. Does Scottish dance require a lot of energy? It does. It's a very athletic form of dance. They say that a six-step Highland fling, which is the first dance that the girls learn, is um, the equivalent of running a mile on your toes with your hands in the air. So it is a very athletic style of, style of dance, yes. Loch is the Scottish word for lake. Loch Ness is a deep freshwater lake located in the Scottish Highlands near Inverness. Loch Ness is best known for the folklore surrounding the Loch Ness Monster, or as she's more affectionately known, Nessie. 
While there have been many alleged Nessie sightings, there's no actual proof of her existence. But the idea that she might be real has a kind of magic that keeps people looking for her year after year. We hope you've enjoyed today's trip to Scotland as much as we have. From the joyous cheers of the camper toss and the glorious sounds of the bagpipe to the hushed excitement on the putting green at Old Course's 18th hole. Scotland is a place where history creates a frame for the warp, while modern accomplishments weave the weft for a colorful national fabric that isn't simply good, it's twice as good! Is good with Hadley and Delaney is brought to you by Mila. Emma Besser, forever better. Mila. And by Cuties. Cute, you can eat. Cuties. <laughs>